So I was thinking about this. Should George Floyd have actually been staying at home, wearing a mask and social distancing instead of being outside, supposedly, allegedly passing a fake $20 bill? And even in general, why were all the people out there who were recording this? I didn't see anyone wearing masks. Maybe if people had just actually listened and realized there's a pandemic going on and wanted to save old people's lives and at-risk people's lives, especially people of color, and had stayed home wearing masks, none of this would have happened. Is that true? So, snark aside, there's a few things. I'm going to be reading you two articles, one from fee.org, uh, .org, yeah, fee.org, Foundation of Economic Education, and this is by Anthony Davis and James R. Harrigan, named No Policy Can Save Lives, It Can Only Trade Lives, which I think is very accurate that people are learning and seeing with this current pandemic. And I keep saying that word, and I think that word gets my videos kind of struck down. So I might look here and say something else. There's someone, I listened to Viva Frey, I think I never say something else. And talking about Viva Frey, he's a, he's a law, he's a law blog, law blog, blah, 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 law blog. Uh, <laughs> from the rest of the world. But anyway, this is better than blah, blah, blah. Um, he was talking about something, he said something in it that I'm, I might look to say different words. I just kind of I try not to self-censor in that sense and just see if the algorithms are still work and just do a better job at presenting these things. Okay, and it's probably not with these kind of digressions. If you're still here, thank you. So the other one's going to be Minneapolis uh, officer attorney, alleges uh, George Floyd overdosed on fentanyl, says charges should be dropped. And this is by Fox 32 in Chicago. Chicago. So we're life forms. So we're risk averse. Part of the reason our life forms are existing, part of the reason we exist right now, is because we come from life forms that were somewhat more risk averse than the other ones that died off before reproducing and passing on their actual genes and, and, and memes of ways of living and things like that. So when you have something like this current issue with Rona Chan, people do get into some panic and people who normally err more on the side of caution seem to do better. It's that whole, if you're walking in the woods thing, this is an off-repeated one, if you hear a snap, you can either think, oh, that's just a twig falling from a tree, or you can think it's a lion, a tiger, or some other kind of predator. So you can, if it's just a twig falling from the tree, you don't need to run. If it's a lion, you run. You do some kind of evasive maneuvers. And if it turns out that it's just a twig and you ran, chances are you're still okay. But then, if it turns out it was a lion and you thought it was a twig and the other person you're walking with, or anybody else, let's say you, you're just by yourself, you don't evade that predator, that predator eats you and you're done. So people err on the side of caution. That seems to be a thing to do. But then there could also be a thing where you think you unashtuka, unashtuka is you get shocked in Swahili, unashtuka. I like, I like that. That's one of my, my favorite ways of saying it's shocked. It's spoken in different languages like French, Italian. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you what it is uh, right now in the Italian. That's the last language I actually remember. But I think unashtuka, umeshtuka sounds better then you're, I mean, shocked. <laughs> I'm surprised. Like, yeah, you know, like uh, Japanese anime with the females. The, anyway, so you not do this. Why are you still listening, by the way? Let me know why you're still listening in the comment section if you're actually still listening. Okay, <laughs> so if you actually do that, you get shocked and you run. Maybe you sprain your ankle. And then now when the actual, uh, when the actual predator comes in the future, you're not able to actually get away. Or you break something, you slip and break something, and then you get sepsis in your wound. So there's also something where it's like, okay, if you have the time to analyze and see if it actually is a predator, and then once you find out it might be a predator, but the predator is really far away, or it's not really as big of a risk, it's really slow, the predator itself might have been sleeping, and then it kind of just like had a little move, and then it broke a twig and things like this. Or maybe it's a twig falling because a tree is falling. So even, yeah, it's a twig, but you still got to move. So there's different things to consider. And then once you've gotten that new information, you shouldn't just continue running for the sake of running. That makes any sense. So <laughs> when it comes to this, let's read this article because I think I just recorded a separate video talking about the, the different things. And I've been talking about this for the different things that are happening in order to prevent the, the actual danger that the Corona Chan, that Rona Chan is, is holding to the world some of the things being done are going to end up losing a lot of lot more lives in ways that are very preventable. So here we go. No policy can save lives, it can only trade lives. If it saves just one life, is this empty slogan. And most definitely, because this, this is one meme where it's like, okay, so people say, if you wear personal protective equipment, the masks, and do social distance, because if it saves one life, it's worth it. Then you go with something like with the hydrochloroquine, that uh, the hydrochloroquine with the anthromethazine or something, and then the zinc packs in some kind of treatment method. 
So I'd like to make a clarification here. This video might get flagged anyway if there's some kind of way of flagging these things. But there's different things. The actual thing that I'm talking about here is hydroxychloroquine. And that droxy actually changes the element with zinc or either azithromycin or doxycycline. Doxycycline, cycline, I think that's the thing. So there's different tests and things. When you're supposed to take it as an outpatient, is it before when somebody is in threat? Is it supposed to prevent the thing? It's not something you take when somebody is suffering from many different other things and they're very ill from it. So there's different reasons of why you would take it or why you would test, and there's different tests out there that you can go out and look for yourself. Now back to the actual <laughs> video initial recording of me saying hydrochloroquine and just completely flubbing this whole thing. And you're saying, oh, that's a quack, thick quack thing. It's not actually showing. But it's like, hey, if that saves one life, if hydrochloroquine and these other two things and this treatment can save one life, then it's worth it. Is that the case? You don't really see that being done. Okay, the reading. In times of crisis, politicians want to look like they're doing something and don't want to hear about limits on their authority. In times of crisis, people want someone to do something and don't want to hear about trade-offs. This is the breeding ground for grand policies uh, driven by the mantra, if it saves just one life, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo invoked the mantra to defend his closure policies. The mantra has echoed across the country from county councils to mayors to school boards to police and to clergy as a justification for closures, curfews, and enforced social distancing. Whenever I see police, I want to say policy, especially when you're talking about something like a fee.org. Maybe just read through the word before I actually say the word out loud. Okay, continue the reading. Rational people understand this is how the world works. Regardless of whether we acknowledge them, trade-offs exist. And acknowledging trade-offs is an important part of constructing sound policy. Unfortunately, even mentioning trade-offs in a time of crisis brings the accusation that only heartless beasts would balance human lives against dollars. But each one of us balances human lives against dollars and any number of other things every day. 5,000 Americans die each year from choking on solid food. We can save every one of those lives by mandating that all meals be pureed. Pureed food isn't appetizing, but if it saves just one life, it must be worth doing. Your chance of dying while driving a car is almost double your chance of dying while driving an SUV. We can save, save lives by mandating that everyone drive bigger cars. SUVs are more expensive and worse for the environment, but if it saves just one life, it must be worth doing. Heart disease kills almost 650,000 Americans each year. We could reduce the incidence of heart disease by 14% by mandating that everyone exercise daily. Many won't want to exercise every day, but if it saves just one life, it must be worth doing. Legislating any of these things would be ridiculous, and most sane people know as much. How do we know? Because each of us makes choices like these every day that increase the chances of our dying. We do so because there are limits on what we're willing to give up to improve our chances of staying alive. Our daily actions prove that none of us believes that if it saves just one life is a reasonable basis for making decisions. Yet when a threat like the coronavirus emerges, we go looking for an imaginary cure that will save lives without trade-offs. The president of the Federal Bank in St. Louis estimated that our current politician-induced shutdown will yield 30% unemployment and a 50% reduction in the GDP in the second quarter of this year. That is a $2.6 trillion price tag in just the second quarter. Before the social distancing, the CDC's worst case projection for the U.S. was 1.7 million deaths. Even under this worst case scenario, and even if the cost was only 50% reduction in the GDP for only one quarter, the shutdown will have cost us 1.5 million per life saved. If the actual deaths are fewer and the cost of the shutdown greater, the cost per life saved could be much, much more. The tired counter argument is that we should tell this to the families who have lost loved ones to the virus. But that cuts both ways because we can also tell it to the families who will lose loved ones to the poverty, depression, suicide, and domestic violence that will accompany a 30% unemployment rate. In the U.S. each year, there are 10 million cases of domestic abuse and over 47,000 suicides. The shutdown will increase these numbers, adding to the 1.5 million cost per life saved. Calls to the mental abuse hotlines in the U.S. have increased almost 900% since the shutdown. The uncomfortable truth is that no policy can save lives. It can only trade lives. Good policies result in a net positive trade-off. 
But we have no idea whether the trade-off is a net positive until we take a sober look at the cost of saving lives. And we can't do that until we stop with the, if it saves just one life, nonsense. We don't know the virus's mortality rate because we haven't conducted randomized testing. We don't know the cost of the economic shutdown because we've never shut down our economy before. What we do know is that policies designed to stop the spread of the virus at all costs are designed more out of fear than out of concern for saving lives. It's time we took a sober look at what this shutdown is costing us. And that is the article from fee.org, no policy can save lives, it can only trade lives. And that is an accurate thing. And now when, before I get into this next article about the George Floyd situation, think about this. If there was an actual policy, not just a mandate, but an actual law that had gone through the actual legal system, it wasn't just a mayor or a governor or some kind of city council making a mandate from the executive level and not if it actually went through the process that is in the Republic of the United States of America, different branches of government that are, it's not just on the federal level, but even when you go down to state, when you go down to municipalities, to cities, they normally have that three-part system where there's like a judicial, a legislative, and the executive. Executive. That's normally what's actually done there. Most of the things being done all over the world, but specifically in the United States of America, since it has that three-part government, is just executive mandates, where it's not necessarily something where it's, oh, this is a part of the law. So let's say it was done through the law, and it was actually a law in the books where it was saying the police themselves had to go around and actually ensure people did not leave their homes without wearing masks. Technically, if George Floyd was not wearing a mask when he left his home, could he his, his life have been saved by that actual law? When people say defund the police, the police are crap. Some of the things Derek Chauvin did, it seemed he shouldn't have been employed because he had a lot of knocks on his actual case. He had a lot of complaints against him and he was still employed. That is a big issue. Now, here's another one. A lot of the people who are like, okay, defund the police. Reimagine the police force and things like that. Let's get social workers and things like this. We'll be against the drug war. So let's say the drug war had actually not been stopped, but had been increased, and you had a lot more, a lot more significant punishments for people who were found dealing fentanyl. Would that have saved George Floyd from having access to the fentanyl, where the, the complications that happened with him actually having it, would that have saved one life if you were actually arresting and putting dealers into jail for life just being caught with the drugs. Would, would, would that have affected what changed? Would that have saved one life? Would that have been worth it? This the police. If you leave the police as is, and then I can show you one incident where something that Derek Chauvin did happened to lead directly to some life being saved. Would that make it, oh, then we should keep Derek Chauvin employed and what he did with George Floyd, which might have led to his death, is inconsequential because hiring Derek Chauvin saved one life. No, that whole, if it saved one life thing, is not something people actually use. So now let me read the article. Minneapolis officer's attorney alleges George Floyd overdosed on fentanyl, says charges should be dropped. They're not going to be dropped. At least from the little that I know, it's not going to be dropped. We'll go through. But just like the recent uh, Mike Brown thing, the hands up, don't shoot thing, that was found to not be true. And I already found information <laughs> years ago showing that that wasn't true, that he did say hands up, don't shoot. It was actually by the book's arrest. And I don't think the officer had as many issues in his background as uh, Derek Chauvin here. Did not know Mike Brown like Derek Chauvin had previous actually work with um, George Floyd as a, as a bouncer. There, there's issues to go into this. But even that hasn't been shown to have an effect on what he actually did in this actual um, arrest. So so anyway, I think the case will go through and what they're being charged for, there is, doesn't seem to be enough evidence to actually get them serious jail time for what they've been charged from. They might actually get like, or especially as in, in specific, the three other officers who just were there as this was happening and keeping people away. And the other two officers who were behind the car who had their knees on George Floyd, on different parts of George Floyd as well. Oh, that might be mentioned in here. So let me just get to the reading. Minneapolis, Fox 9. In a new filing in the case against now-fired uh, Minneapolis police officer involved in the killing of George Floyd, the officer's attorney alleged that Floyd overdosed on fentanyl while resisting arrest and in doing so contributed to his own death, arguing the charges against the officer should be dropped. Thomas Lane is charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter in connection to Floyd's Memorial Day death. In July, his attorney, Earl Gray, Earl Gray, is that the name of the alcohol? 
Earl Grey? I think it is. Okay. Uh, filed a motion to dismiss the charges against Lane, arguing there is not enough evidence to establish probable cause that the former rookie officer committed the crime. And yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is showing directly from, this is probably one of the people who was kneeling uh, on his back or on his legs because there was two people behind the car of that infamous picture. So this, in Monday's filing, Gray doubled down on the idea that Floyd swallowed drugs while the officers were attempting to take him into custody pointing to the disappearance of a white spot on Floyd's tongue in the body camera video, he argues it t looks like two milligrams of fentanyl, a lethal dose. So that's, that's a video that recently came out of body cam footage that showed the actual initial arrest when he was in the vehicle and he was removed out. Because before I was looking, he was outside of the vehicle and was like, okay, well, why wasn't he wearing a mask? He was removed from the vehicle. But there's people walking around recording and things like that that are not wearing masks. So there's things like that with those double things in there. But yeah, so um, this is something that does happen and it is part of the drug war thing where people get panicked and then they take more drugs. I don't know if he was on drugs from before that. And let's say it wasn't just the fentanyl that he took. He might have been on something else before it that could have led to more complications. It might not have been his fentanyl. He could have been selling it to somebody else. And then again, for me personally, I don't think selling drugs should be illegal. Any adult should be able to sell to another adult whatever substance that other adult wants to ingest and put into their system and both people profit from that. The adult gets whatever intoxication they want. The person selling it has obtained that good and is selling it to somebody else. They're not forcing me to take it. I don't want them advertising it and getting children on it who, can, who can't actually make the decisions. But when it comes to this, it's okay. It's, it, to me, it's legal. Okay. It should be legal. It shouldn't be, Ill it shouldn't be illegal. It should just be decriminalized. It's just a thing. It's not illegal, like encouraged, but just it should just be a thing. Okay. All he had to do was sit in the police car like every other defendant who was initially arrested while attempting to avoid his arrest all by himself. Um, Mr. Floyd overdosed on fentanyl, the court documents read. Given his intoxication level, breathing would have been difficult at best. Mr. Floyd's intentional failure to obey commands coupled with his overdosing contributed his to his own death. And this is another thing. That there's another meme with this whole situation where it's like that, that whole like time travel meme where it's like I, this, this is it's on the screen right now. This, this, this man, this king with, with pink hair goes back in the past and is like, oh, girls of the time machine. Thank you for letting me vote. And I think he's talking to Susan B. Anthony if I have this right. And Susan B. Anthony's like, what? And then below it's like men with a uh, time machine. The guy goes back and he starts talking about how like, oh, uh, George Floyd actually over, like, took an, uh, an overdose of fentanyl. Just let him sit in your car. Chances are he's probably going to die anyway from he's sitting up there because he's not going to breathe in the amount of fentanyl. And then it's Derek Chauvin with his knee. Somebody else posted that and a friend was like, the friend who posted it was like, it would have been better if it's if Derek Chauvin says, shut up, I'm going to arrest him anyway. And that's what I put on the meme. That's the meme on the screen. And that, that is accurate. I think Derek Chauvin himself had certain issues. And this right here seems to be about Thomas Lane, not Derek Chauvin. I think Derek Chauvin is going to see jail time just from his whole part in this and his history with it. The other cops, I think, will get off. That's that's my my very uneducated and uninformed opinion or guess on what's going to happen with that. The Hennepin County um, Medical Examiner's autopsy report says toxico toxicology testing found fentanyl and evidence of recent methamphetamine use in Floyd's system. But the report ultimately ruled the death of George Floyd a homicide. The updated version of the medical examiner's report states that on May 25th, George Floyd experienced a cardiopulmonary arrest while, the restrain while being restrained by law enforcement officers. A separate autopsy ordered by Floyd's family and released by attorney Benjamin Crump, determined that asphyxia from sustained pressure was a cause of death. The additional autopsy was conducted after the family said that the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's findings did not address in detail the effects of the purposeful use of force on Mr. Floyd's neck and the extent of Mr. Floyd's suffering at the hands of police. Floyd died on May 25th while being detained by Minneapolis officers police officers, during, including Lane, who held down Floyd's legs, while Officer Derek Chauvin pressed his knee on, into Floyd's neck. Chauvin is charged with second-degree mur murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter in Floyd's death, while the other two officers involved, J. Alexander Quang and uh, To Thao, are facing the same two aiding and abetting charges as Lane. Lane's attorney is expected to present his arguments for dismissing the charges against the former officer at the next court hearing, in the case on September 11th. 
Oh, September 11th. That's that's a big day for the United States of America as well. And now there's there's something here. This is another good thing. This access to information. As I was mentioning before in the previous video that I talked about, where I was recording that thing about actual reports coming out about what Rona Chan is doing and the actual ancillary effects of it. I talked about this in the fee article. They're talking about hey, there's actual research and information coming in that doing this, shutting this down, is actually going to have this knockdown effect. Here in this article about the actual uh, case. The actual full casing here, the full cases here, so people can come on and say, oh, the, the system of the law, is it's clear, we saw the video, just throw these people in jail, what are you talking about? Well, here, you can actually go on and read the memorandum. You can see yourself and see, is this legal? Are these people being wrong? Are they are they reporting things, ignoring certain things that are in there? This is the actual medical examiner's findings. These are what the quote-unquote experts are saying about these things, but you can go on yourself and you can find this information. There's more access to information right now than ever has been. We're living in a time when we have acquired ignorance destruction systems and better forms of human information vectors. Better human information vectors all over the place. So we're doing, we're living in this time. It's a good time. It's a good time regardless of these things. Now, with the initial question I was asking about this, would it be better if George Floyd was at home? Do masks save lives? Is that what we need to do to protect people? If it saves just one life, is it worth it? If you think the police need to be defunded in right now, if you think, who who do you think the police are working for? Are they working for you or are they in law enforcement agents? Who is setting those laws if not the government? In those areas where some of these things are happening, who is the government? It is people who are Democrats. Some people are saying, we need to change this. We need to, oh, we need Trump to do this. If you live in the United States of America, it is a republic. It's supposed to come down to the state level. If you think Trump had failed at something with the information you had available, you could say, look, Back in February, I had access to this information, so Trump must have had access to this information, yet Trump didn't do this thing that I think would have been better, so he is responsible for these people being dead today. Then why did your mayor not do it? Why did your city council not do it? Why did your governor not do that thing? Did Trump say they can't do these things? Did those people say, I have done X, Y, Z, and because... I'm doing this thing, I am limited by this way, and this is how Trump is preventing me from doing this thing. Do, do people believe that? If there were actually laws to keep people in their homes, keep businesses shut down, do these kind of social distancing things, demand people wear masks, who would enforce the masks? Who would enforce that? Wouldn't it be the same police that you think need to be defunded? How well do you think Derek Chauvin would go about enforcing a mask mandate versus enforcing whatever kind of potential... Uh, again, the, the, the money laundering, when you do fake money, it's supposed to go to like the Secret Service. The Secret Service was actually invented to actually deal with money, deal with money for, and forgery and things like that, which is something many people might not actually know that now it goes into like the, I think most people relate to the Secret Service with protecting the president and things like that. But maybe the executive branch is more involved with actual money and things like that. Oh, anyway, so there, there is a thing. How, who do you think will do this? Do you think Derek Chauvin will be able to actually do this in a in a more conducive way? So if you actually get into a situation where you need to enforce the mask mandate, does that result in actually reducing police funding or do you need to increase police funding so there's more people going around enforcing this mask mandate? Anyway, so there's many questions to be had here. Many little question marks, things I'm wondering like, are you really understanding what you're talking about? What are people talking about with these things? How many things in your life do you really think? Have you ever actually thought, I'm not going to do this thing because if it saves one life? There are some things which are at a further distance and things like that where I think things happen. But just what do you think about that saying? What do you think about George Floyd? What do you think is going to happen with the actual case? Do you think these are going to be dropped? Do you think that's a valid thing? Do you think people are really understanding the trade-offs that are going on in many parts in life, in many parts where we demand, okay, we want security for this, but doing security of this brings a threat of this other thing happening, even if it reduces the threat of this other thing. And then how much of a reduction of threat to this other thing, what level of threat is sufficient to back up the supposed protection against this nebulous threat, whether it is to yourself or others? It's a good question to ask, and I think we ask ourselves these questions on a daily basis. But that's it for now. Like, share, subscribe. I appreciate you taking your time to listen to this. It's also links to our merchandise store, wherever you listen to this. Probably going to be links somewhere where you can go and find some stuff and purchase and uh, might be entertained and, and informed or just, just find it fashionable. Till next time, goodbye.